Welcome to the selling show where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. All right, my friends. Well, you are in for a real treat today. I have the man, the myth, the (laughs) legend, and most importantly, the author of The Boutique, Mr. Greg Alexander. Greg, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we turned on the microphones, I told you that your book, The Boutique, is like a dense, flourless chocolate cake. And even in the introduction to the book, you mentioned, hey, I kept this short. You know, CEOs don't have time to read. So I'm going to give it to you fast and furious, dense, intense, checklist driven, skimmable, scannable. What a fantastic job. I was almost not going to say this, but I think I will say it because it's, it's a huge compliment. You could read just the first 20 pages yeah. of Greg's book and get massive value. Luckily, there's 250 more pages, but they go by so fast and it is filled with so much smart stuff. And I want to talk to you about this. It is one third start the boutique, one third scale the boutique, and one third sell the boutique. So tell us a little bit about your professional backstory of how you did this in your own business. And then let's talk about how you're helping others to do it today. Yeah, so my career can be summarized really into three chapters. So I came off the college campus. I got hired by a hot tech company called EMC, which is now part of Dell Computer. And I rose up through the ranks there. I spent a decade there. I went back to school, got my MBA, and I came out of that. And I started a management consulting firm called SBI, which stood for Sales Benchmark Index. And what they did was they specialized in business-to-business sales effectiveness. And I started, scaled, and sold. That's why the book is set up that way, SBI, in 11 years. And and we had a really good exit. I share the numbers in the book just to inspire others that they can do this. We sold the business for $162 million. We bootstrapped it, so we owned all of it, and we didn't have any debt. So it was a great outcome for everybody. And, And I share that because sometimes people think that they can't hit it big if they're in the services sector, and I disagree. I think you can. Not everybody has to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. So now I'm in chapter three. And after I, when I sold my firm, I was only 47 years old and I thought I was done. I thought it was the finish line, but I realized there's only so many rounds of golf you can play, only so many stakes you can eat. So it was more of a stepping stone than a finish line. And I've been a long time member of mastermind communities, a few EO, YPO, Tiger 21. And I love the nature of a membership community, a mastermind community. So I got an idea and I said, geez, I wonder if there's other people out there like me back then, meaning founders of boutique pro serve firms that would love to get together with their peers, swap notes, share ideas, try to, you know, start, scale and sell their firm. So I launched Collective 54, which is, to my knowledge, the first mastermind community dedicated to this community, which is the founders of thriving professional services firms. And when I say pro serve, sometimes that needs a description. So think lawyers, accountants, consultants marketing agencies, IT service providers, people that don't have a product, but they market, sell, and deliver their expertise on some version of the billable hour is really kind of our focus. And then what happened was, is because of my luck with EMC and my good fortune with SBI, I opened a family office called Capital 54. And for your audience members that might not be familiar with with what a family office is, it's, it's just like a private equity firm, but instead of investing other people's money, you invest your own money. The reason why it's called Capital 54 is because it invests in Collective 54 members. Some of those members reach a point in their business that they need an injection of growth capital and they need you know, mentorship and more kind of one-on-one assistance so they become clients of Capital 54. So that's what we're doing. Wow. Really, really good. So take us back to the SBI days. One of the things that really struck me from the book and maybe you did it this way, maybe it was some slight wrinkle variation. You say in the book, very few successful boutique firms are started as a solo, that they're usually started as a partnership, right? One subject matter expert, one rainmaker, and then one person who likes dealing with clients and process and so forth. 
that to me was hugely surprising because I always thought the evolution was one person, hire a COO, hire a team, hire some delivery people, then hire some salespeople, then hire some marketing people. Talk about starting as a threesome or a foursome versus starting as a solo. And how, how did you do it at SBI? So at SBI, we started with those three. I was the rainmaker. We had a, an individual that was kind of the scientist or the person that you know, built the service. And then we had a group led by one of my co-founders who actually delivered the service for clients. And those are kind of the three legs of the stool, in my opinion. What I found was when we were doing our homework, particularly for Capital 54 and trying to prove or disprove investment hypotheses, is that most solopreneurs never make it out of the life cycle business stage. What ends up happening is they become what I call the founder bottleneck. And when they start their firms, their goal is to prove to themselves that they can make a living and not have to work for the man. And that's a really important thing. I mean, I went through that myself. Then they get to that point and they're living a nice lifestyle. And some of those folks, their ambition doesn't expand from there. And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a personal preference. And they don't want the headache of lots of clients, lots of employees, a complicated P&L, et cetera, et cetera. So they stay a one-man shop or one-woman shop, or maybe they do hire, but it's not co-founders or partners. It's kind of a hero with a bunch of little helpers. And that's a group. And there's millions of those in the United States. A boutique contrasted to that is very different. The founder or co-founders who start the firm, they have big aspirations from day one. The idea of being in a lifestyle business would be a prison sentence for these folks. They want to build something substantial. They want to build a firm that creates a legacy that is a lot more than just them. And in that category, according to the federal government, now this was at the end of 2021, so it's a little dated. There's approximately 1.5 million firms in NAICS in the United States between 10 and 250 employees. That's our definition of a boutique. And if you think about the broader professional services sector, there's only 4,116 firms that have truly reached scale, scale defined as more than 250 billable employees. So if you think about it, that's one quarter of 1%. So there's this huge industry of all these brave people that started their firms who all want to scale, but for some reason, they're having a hard time. But if you study those 4,000 or so firms and you figure out what it is that they do, and we were lucky to be one of those, it's really not that hard. It's just, for some reason, there's a mystery around it. It's, it's been like underdocumented, if that's such a thing. So the book is attempting to demystify that and speak in practical terms and say, hey, if you're one of these cats in this category, go do these things. And you know maybe you'll have similar results to those that have reached scale. We interrupt this interview with an important announcement. If you're committed to better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees, get over to doitselling.com right now and grab a copy of my new book. That's the deal, kids. Grab a copy of the new book and then get all the bonuses, companion tools, trainings, and downloads at doitselling.com. Buy the book, get the bonuses. Buy the book, get the bonuses. Buy the book, get the bonuses. That's how it works. I'll see you over there. Tell me, so consulting firm or even professional services firm, we often think of consulting and consultants, but I'm guessing that also in this category would be things like training companies where they do their primary distribution method for their expertise is training or a coaching company. So I've got several friends, for example, who have really big like eight figure coaching companies that do like real estate coaching or coaching for ophthalmologists. And they've got 30 coaches on their team and it's a scalable operation that way. So we're including folks like that, correct? We are. And there's many examples. You just mentioned a few of thriving, fast growing, big companies in those categories. What we're not including is the blue collar service. So think cafeteria services, janitorial services, et cetera. That's a different business model. So the reason why I I chose 54, because it's not just consultants or it's not just marketing agencies, it's not just IT services firms, it's one layer above that. And I think that's the right layer because what they have in common, therefore what makes them peers, is they have the same business model. Now, whether you execute that business model through coaching, training, consulting, 
what have you, you're still marketing, selling, and delivering expertise in some package. And it's through the business model where a lot of the gain is had. I would classify our members in Collective 54 as this. They're brilliant, brilliant, brilliant domain experts, but maybe not the best business people. So for example, you know, given your expertise, and I I understand you got a new book coming out to talk about this. Sometimes these brilliant domain experts, they don't like to sell, right? It's just not their thing. Well, well, because selling is independent of a domain. And and I would I would suggest, and I'm sure you agree, you've got to be really good at that if you want to scale and if you want to sell. If you don't, and you just want to run a nice little three-person, four-person shop, then you can probably get by on referrals and word of mouth and that kind of thing. But if you really want to scale, you need to do these other things. So that's what we focus on at Collective 54 is, is kind of the business side of the expertise sector. Yes, absolutely. I'm curious, Greg, knowing that some of these folks may have aspirations, some of the folks listening may have an aspiration, say, oh man, I would love to be Greg Alexander. I would love to scale this thing. I would love to sell this thing. Talk about when you look at some of the firms that come to you on the investment side, what are some of the DNA markers of a scalable and saleable firm that you look for? Yeah, great question. This is something I've given a lot of thought. So the first thing I, I look for, and I have a whole evaluation criteria around this, is that the riches are in the niches. So I'm looking for a business that has a true expertise in some very small niche. And as a result of that, they truly have a moat around their business, if you remember that terminology from Warren Buffett. Now, the market has to be big enough to matter, but it has to be small enough that that niche provider can be the dominant provider in that space. So what the first thing I think about is the market itself. Then I want to consider the team. And I ask myself the question, is this a bankable team? So, for example, your first question was, if it's a solopreneur, the answer is no, it's not a bankable team. Why? Well, if that solopreneur gets hit by a bus tomorrow, God forbid, there's no more firm, right? So there has to be a team. So that's the next thing I look at. Then I dive into the financial characteristics of the business. So broadly speaking, a professional services firm should be able to run a business about 80% gross margin and about 50% EBITDA margin. And if they're not doing those things, they usually have some issues, like maybe they're not charging enough for their services. Maybe they have too many employees or they're paying their employees too much money or they haven't productized their service and every every project's a snowflake. Maybe they're underutilizing technology and the list goes on and on and on. So I'm looking for the financial characteristics of that. And then I also consider the personal goals of the founders. And are they in congruence? For example, I would walk away from something where you had three founders, you know, one was 60, one was 45, and one was 25. I mean, that's a disaster. Here's why. The 60-year-old and the 45-year-old and 25-year-old, as time goes on, they're at different life stages, and they're going to want different things from their business. And so there's going to be a lot of infighting. Drama equals disaster in a people-driven business. So I stay away from those things. So those are a few things that I look for. I also want to talk about revenue sources. You talk, and and a lot of people, when they hit this chapter, it's chapter four, again, in that first 20 pages, they're like, oh my God, we've been doing this all wrong. So, you know, the first one or two are obvious to people, but I'd love to read the rest and then get some ideas from you about how, how you've seen firms implement some of these other ones that are less obvious with some success. So hourly billings and retainers. First two people go, yeah, yeah, got that. No problem. Good. That's our business. But then you add performance-based contracts, memberships, licensing, subscriptions, events, and royalties. And at this point, people are going, man, oh man, have I missed the boat on some of these. So you recommend at least three, correct? Correct. Talk to us about how this rolls out in actually implementing this with the successful firms that you've worked with. It's a great question. You know, our point of view is that a boutique pro serve firm has a life cycle. And the life cycle lasts in total cradle to grave or launch to exit about 15 years. The three stages are the three that you mentioned in the book, start, scale, and exit. And each stage is approximately five years, although there is some variance in that depending on the firm. And what ends up happening almost every single time is that in the first stage, they start out with the basics, hourly billings and retainers. 
they start out with our hourly billings and they say, wow, I can't believe someone's going to pay me X amount per hour to do this. And then they keep inching that up. And then they realize, oops, this revenue stream is capped because there's only so many hours in the year. So then they say, all right, I'm going to try to get to some recurring revenue and let's start talking about retainers. Retainers are also capped. There's only so many retainers you can take on at any given time and it's capped. I'm going to pay you $10,000 a month in a retainer. It's capped. There's no upside. So then they, when they leave that first stage, the start stage, and they enter into the scale stage, they have this epiphany. And they say, we got to redo our monetization strategy or our business model. We got to walk away from hourly billings and retainers and try to do other things. The first thing they normally do is the fixed bid. And for those that might not be familiar with that, that's basically saying you sell a deliverable to a client, whatever that is. The client pays you a fixed amount of money. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to issue that deliverable. They're buying the output. Now, this is extremely profitable for consulting companies in particular. And my old firm, SBI, when we sold, we had $16 million in EBITDA, only $30 million in revenue. And we only had 30 people. So we're doing a million dollars per head. I share those numbers because that's what fixed bids can do for you. And they're hugely profitable because the money coming in from the client has nothing to do with the labor. It has to do with the output. So if you can get really good at productizing your service and doing work over and over again, the experience curve says, first time you do it, it's expensive and you don't do it well. But the hundredth time you do it, you can do it in your sleep and make a lot of money on it. So that's the next progression. And that happens usually in the scale stage. Then inevitably, the second thing that happens is a client says, hey, I'm looking at your fee. It's $500,000 to produce XYZ. I'm bearing all the risk. So I'll tell you what, I'll pay you 250 grand to do the work. And I'll pay another $250,000 if the business result is obtained. That's called a performance-based fee. That's also a wonderful opportunity because the way that you would rebut that is you say, fine, I'll put half my fees at risk, but I want to participate in the upside. So in that deal, 500 grand, 250 up front, 250 on the back end, the 250 on the back end is now another half a million. There's incentives or accelerators if I do that. So you add that layer in. Then you might get into royalties as an example. So maybe you're producing a piece of intellectual capital and there's other firms out there that want to use your intellectual capital. Well, they're going to pay you a royalty and it's going to be governed by a licensing contract. So now you're making money in your sleep and those things start to get layered in. But it is a progression over time. But the most important thing for your listeners to take away from this is a single source of revenue is too risky. You've got to have at least three, preferably you have a whole portfolio of ways that you can derive revenue from clients. Yeah. Wow. Again, a huge, huge eye opener for so many folks. I want to talk a little bit about sales, obviously, sales, prospecting, business development. One of the things that you say is once you are at that mid-level boutique, there is a lot of opportunity to extract additional work and additional fees from your existing clients. And people usually, they don't look at that. They don't prioritize that. They're always on the hunt for new, new, new. And that's a mistake. Early on, when a boutique is in startup mode, what are some prospecting strategies? What are some outreach strategies that maintain your thought leadership position so you're not an ambulance chaser, but at the same time, give you enough volume of opportunities and volume of conversations to get a good running start? So in the early stages, it's all about new client acquisition because you're young, immature, no one knows who you are, the phone's not ringing, you know, emails aren't showing up in the inbox. So you got to go out and you got to shake the trees. The best place to do that, in my opinion, is your own personal network because people know you. They probably are familiar with your previous work, whatever that was, and maybe they'll give you a shot on a project or two. You know, and if you've got two or three co-founders and you consider the three networks of those three co-founders, that's a decent market to go after. It's very cost effective. You don't have to spend any money on advertising, et cetera. And I recommend starting there. And that can get you out of that first phase. I mean, it's not uncommon to see a business reach three, four, five million dollars just by being effective networkers, refer generators, and, and word of mouth. However, if you want to scale beyond that, your personal network is, is defined. It's capped by definition. You only know so many people. So eventually, 
the law of large numbers says you have to be able to go out and sell work to people who never heard of you before, don't know you personally. So then you got to add other channels into the mix. The most effective one that I think there is, is inbound content-driven marketing. Why do I feel that way? Well, for those that are listening to this show, you're in the business of the expertise business. So you want people to experience your expertise. So you write books, you do what we're doing today, which is podcasts. Maybe you've got a YouTube channel, et cetera. And if you're really smart on how you distribute it, you know, through search engine optimization, social media, what have you, then you can start attracting an audience to you. Some of that audience over time, as they consume your content, they become a brand advocate. Therefore, they tell people about you. So you're getting reach or when they have a need, you're the first person they think of and they pick up the phone and they say, hey, Greg, I'm struggling with X, Y, Z. Can you help me? So that's the next step. And that's a really good step. And it can add quite a bit of revenue on top of the first step. The third step is really the secret sauce. And this is outbound. And very few boutique pro serves do this. But those that do it well are the giant ones. They're the ones that go from you know, a decent sized firm to like, holy cow, how did those people do that? An outbound is what it might sound like. I mean, you build a commercial sales engine. These are non-billable resources that you eat on the P&L. And they're reaching out through a variety of channels through outbound. And they're contacting people who have no idea who you are, what you do, why you exist, et cetera. And they're you know selling and they're prospecting to that group. It's very hard, but it's doable. My firm did it. Collective 54 does it. Many Collective 54 members do it. And if you're somebody listening to this and you really have big dreams, you know, you want to get to a firm that might have 100, 200, 300 people. You want a nine figure exit, you know, north of $100 million. You really don't have a choice. It's actually kind of an illusion that you have a choice. The math would tell you that you have to do this at some point. Now, it's a big expense. It's very risky, requires a lot of trial and error. So, you know, you only do this when you're coming out of the scale stage and you used to grow at 30% a year and now you're growing at 15%. And you can't see another way to get yourself back up to 30%. So you make the investment in this kind of final frontier, which is the outbound sales model. But don't go there until you've completely tapped out the referral network and until you've mastered the inbound content marketing approach. Now, you talk in the book about having that outbound landscape back when we were doing SBI. And you said, okay, we are consultants for B2B sales leaders. And here's how many B2B sales leaders there are. And you kind of go through the math that you initially thought. And then you're like, but you know what? There was some flawed thinking and I made some mistakes and some oversights and some stuff was too big and some stuff was too small. Walk us through yeah. what that was like, because you documented so poignantly in the book. This goes to truly understanding your ideal client profile and understanding your real market, the market that you can actually reach. So the experience that we went through is you're right. We specialize in business to business sales effectiveness for really large corporations. And when you did the TAM on that, it was about 11, 12 million people. And then our service expanded into lead generation. So that brought in the marketing leader. So you could argue that it was 25 million people or so. We were super excited and we started reaching out to all these people and it was crickets. I mean, we couldn't reach anybody. The the gatekeepers had gatekeepers. I mean, that's how hard it was. And then we said, okay, what are we missing here? And what we realized was, is that what we were selling at the time, remember when this was, this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we brought to market sales benchmarking. We were the pioneers of that. And what that basically did was it took the science of benchmarking, which has been around for about 100 years, and applied it to the art of sales. And we got lucky because right when we were doing this, cloud computing hit. And firms like Salesforce.com and HubSpot were being launched. So sales teams all over the place were actually collecting data, you know, really for the first time. And it wasn't in their head or on their hard drive and their PC. So you could apply, you know, scientific data analysis to sales data and start getting into predictive analytics. And that's really what we were doing. But this was like groundbreaking back then. So what we realized is that we were going after the early adopter community. And that was only about 250,000 people out of the 25 million. Now, your listeners are probably saying only 250,000. That's a lot of people. In the world of a market size, it's really not. 
know, 250,000 people is a pretty tight market definition, but they were defined by their psychographic profile, the early adopter. These were people who liked to go first. They liked kind of an incomplete solution that they could tinker with and make their own. You know, they felt that if they were an early adopter, they were proudful of that because it suggested something about them as a leader. They were innovative. So we had to attract these people. So the content marketing that we did identify these people for us. How? They identified themselves. So we would express our expertise, some of this bleeding edge thinking, and then some people would start reading it and subscribe and raise their hand. So they they self-identified. And once we made that switch from kind of mass marketing to niche marketing, things really took off. And then we rode the wave. Because early adopters eventually, quote unquote, cross the chasm, if you remember the great Jeffrey Moore, and they go into the bowling alley and the tornado, and then eventually they get to the mainstream market, and then things really scale at that point. So what to do with this? You know, if you're a listener out there and you're wondering, you know, kind of who your market is, pay as as much attention to the psychographic profile as you do to the demographic profile. That would be my tip. And Greg, when you identified these early adopters, are you saying that they weren't necessarily the big Fortune 1000 companies or some of them were, but some of them were more the kind of the mid-sized, scrappy, looking for the next edge kind of company that you might not have ordinarily paid attention to? So there were three scenarios that emerged, two that were good and one that was bad. So one was there was a new job title that hit the market that we didn't even know existed. It was called sales enablement. And these software as a service companies started hiring these people, directors of sales enablement. And we didn't even know who these were, but these people were all over us like a cheap suit. And they were employed by very large corporations because they were fairly expensive people. And those were the early adopters in that case. We also stumbled into the private equity community. These investors were buying mid-sized firms, and part of their investment thesis was to eke out greater efficiency within the sales force. So they would hire in a VP of sales, and they would say, hey, go read this stuff from SBI. We believe in sales benchmarking because investors are numbers-driven people, and we want you to use that. So that became another home run for us. And in fact, the company today, SBI, probably does the majority of their business there. The third use case, which is bad for us, is we attracted startups. Startups were populated by early adopters and innovative thinkers, but they didn't have any money. And what ended up happening is we started we started doing these tiny little deals. And there was great opportunity cost in that because if I'm tying up resources to work on a $20,000 project and I've got a Fortune 500 company sales enablement guy who's got a $2 million budget, I mean, you know, I'm constrained by headcount. So we had to walk away from the startup community and stay focused on the big companies. And that, you know, we had to learn that because we we made some mistakes and pursued the startups. But in the end, it wasn't worth it for us. Wait, 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 wait. We're not just going to listen to this episode. There are downloads. There are resources. There are links. There are bonuses waiting for you on this episode's page when you go over to doitmarketing.com forward slash podcast. That's right, doitmarketing.com forward slash podcast. Grab the notes right under this episode. See you over there. Let me ask you, because it's such a crazy trend now, and and I, I almost hesitate to ask, but I'll ask because maybe you have some guidance on this. As we're sitting here talking, artificial intelligence, AI, chat GPT, all of these tools are now emerging. And some boutique firms are losing their minds and going, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. You know, the copywriting and the marketing and the sales and we're going to be put out of business and all this stuff. Other people are saying, hey, this is a fantastic tool. You're going to keep doing what you're doing, but you're going to do it faster, smarter, better. And in one third of the time, and it's like having robots as your personal assistants, and it's nothing to be afraid of. It's something to embrace. What is your take on chat GPT and the whole suite of AI tools that are behind it for consulting firms specifically. Yeah. So my point of view on it right now, it's probably the single most important technological advancement that we'll see in our careers. And I think it's going to create the golden era of professional services. Now, why do I feel that way? Well, first, I do believe in survival of the fittest. And I think a lot of people that are being paid to do commodity work are going to get eliminated. But I think that's a good thing. 
because those that do survive are going to be the true leaders in this space. So all those clients that were going to these second and third tier players are now going to come running to them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is really where the money is going to be made, 85% of the expense for a professional services firm is direct labor. And when you can replace payroll cost with technology tools, your margins go through the roof. And those that master artificial intelligence and all the forms that it's going to come as a way to automate service delivery in professional services are going to make a fortune because they're going to be able to serve a hundred times more clients without having to increase any headcount. So the profit margin is going to go up exponentially. Now, there's going to be a rocky road to get there and there's going to be a lot of displaced people. So my advice to take advantage of this, instead of being a victim, try to capitalize on it, is you really got to understand the value that you create for a client. And if you're a firm that's in the pair of hands business and you're just doing something for the client because they don't have enough time to do it, you're dead because they're going to have a machine do it and they won't need you to do it. However, if you really are an expert and you are a subject matter expert, your clients are still going to turn to you for your wisdom. And wisdom plus AI, boy, that's a powerful business model. So I know that we're about to land the plane here, but I could not end this interview without completely destroying the E rating on this podcast for E for Everyone. Talk about the fuck up award. We need to talk about the fuck up award because it is so smart. It is so different. What is the fuck up award, Greg? And how do you recommend our listeners implement their own version of it? So at SBI, we had a very unique culture. And when you're a services business, culture matters because what are you? You're a collection of people. It's not like you got a manufacturing plant and raw materials. So culture really matters. So as a boutique, we were the challenger to these very large firms. And we competed with McKinsey, Bain, BCG. And we found ourselves in boardrooms of major corporations. And sometimes our people were afraid. There's this thing called the imposter syndrome. You know, do I belong here? So I wanted to build a culture where everybody knew it was acceptable to take risk and to go for it. Because when they took the risk and they succeeded, the imposter syndrome went away. And they said, I do belong here. So I wanted to incentivize it. So I created an award called the Fuck Up Award. And forgive my French, but I'm an Italian from Boston and we speak like that sometimes. (laughs) And every week, uh, we had a company-wide conference call and people had to share their biggest fuck up. And they had to say, here's what I did. Here's why it was a fuck up. Here's what I learned. And here's what I'm going to do going forward. And we awarded them with a prize. Sometimes it was cash, like a thousand bucks. Sometimes it was a dinner, gift certificate, what have you. And it became a real cultural touchstone for us. It was amazing. In the beginning, you'd go around the room and say, who had the best fuck up? And nobody would say anything. And then a few months later, I mean, people were fighting for each other to prove how stupid they were, (laughs) to prove how, you know, the big fuck up. But what that did for us is that, It made everybody understand that this is a culture where risk is encouraged and you're not an imposter. You belong. And I will never penalize you if you really go for it. Swing for the fences. If you fall on your face, I don't care. What I will penalize you is if you win and the victory is small because those aren't real victories. Those are incremental improvements. Really go for it. And that's what the fuck up award did. Yeah, no, I really love that. And then even in the book, you you say the fastest way to get fired at SBI was to play it safe. Exactly. Yep. Love we, that. Yep. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about how do we get connected and stay connected to more Greg Alexander brilliance. Where can we get the book? Talk about Collective 54. We're going to link up all of these in the show notes. But Greg, where can we send people to learn more? Yeah. So the website is collective54.com and that's the word collective, the number five, the number four.com. And you can subscribe there to what's called collective 54 insights. And if you do, you get three things every week. On Monday, you get a blog. On Wednesday, you get a video. And on Friday, you get the chart of the week, which is benchmarking data. So that's one place that I would encourage you. If you want to get a copy of the book, then just go to amazon.com and search the boutique how to start, scale, and sell a professional services firm by Greg Alexander. And you can get a copy of it there. Awesome. 
Well, Greg, this is so much fun. We obviously could have talked for hours. So what that means is we have to have you back on the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was really tremendous. And all of those links that Greg mentioned directly under this episode, one-click links waiting for you at thesellingshow.com. Greg, thank you so much for being on. You are a rock star and I appreciate you. Okay, it was great to be here. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.